All right. Welcome everyone today to the Creating Access and Nonprofits uh, Disability Rights Under ADA and 504. This workshop is presented by the New England ADA Center, a project of the Institute of Human Centered Design, and it is sponsored by Arts Equity, Grantmakers Council of Rhode Island, and uh, the Rhode Island State Council on the Arts. My name is Todd Trebor, my pronouns are he, him, and his, and I am the Acting Deputy Director at the Rhode Island State Council on the Arts. Uh, we're going to start off uh, today's session by reading our land acknowledgement. It is RISCA, the Rhode Island State Council on the Arts, practice to acknowledge that the grounds on which we are meeting are Indigenous lands. Our offices in Providence and all Rhode Island are on the ancestral homelands in their Narragansett, Wampanoag, Nipmuc, and Poconoke people. RISCA is a committed ally, and as artists, we honor the Indigenous people, their no. ancestors, the culture, and the artistic representation, past, present, and future. We recognize the continued existence and contributions of Indigenous people to our society today. Thank you all for being here. I'm going to turn this pretty quickly over to uh, my fellow co-host, Janine Chartier of Arts Equity, uh, as well as our presenters today. Just some logistics. We're going to answer questions at the end. You're welcome to put questions that you have uh, during the presentation in the chat. My colleague, Nancy Wolanski from Grantmakers Council of Rhode Island will be checking on those. We have both AI captioning as well as ASL interpreters on this call. The ASL interpreters are really important for us to have for the sake of the archiving of this call. One little glitch in the system, we're not able to add both ASL interpreters to the ASL interpretation channel. If you click on interpretation at the bottom, you'll be able to select that and at least one of them will show up. However, we will have both ASL interpreters spotlit throughout the presentation so they can be seen both by you all as well as those who are doing this recording and archive. If you like AI closed captioning, that is also available. If you click the small CC at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you will see that show up. Uh, and I am now going to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Janine. One second, everyone. Oops, hold on. Before you get started, Janine. Also, need to just add it in. <laughs> all right, Janine, you should be all set now. Great, thank you. And I appreciate everybody's patience and help with all this technology stuff. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today for a presentation about Disability Access 504 and the ADA. Um, as Tard said, I'm the Director of Arts Equity. We do arts education programming for, for children, youth, and adults with disabilities and are affiliated with the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. And this morning, to begin, I'd like to give a brief shout out of appreciation to Judy Human, who very sadly died last weekend. Um, Judy was a warrior at the forefront of major disability rights. Yes, Melissa. I got asked most in Italy when I was in Italy. I'm sorry, I'm real quick. Yeah, if you all can be <laughs> cognizant of being mute. Yes, go. Okay. So yeah, Judy. Judy was a warrior at the front of major disability rights demonstrations. She held sit-ins in San Francisco, stopped traffic in New York, um, you know, held everything down in Washington and Capitol Crawl and the passage of the ADA and other disability rights really would not have been possible without her leadership and her tenacity. And so we really appreciate her. If you have a chance, there's a lot of information right now. NPR did a fabulous story about her, and I would urge you to just go and check some of the uh, stuff. Um, and um, she was featured in the Oscar-nominated documentary film, Crip Camp, which you haven't seen, you should all watch because it's just an amazing film. And, you know, she died last weekend and Judy was fighting for disability inclusion right until the very end. She said, 
Disability only becomes a tragedy when society fails to provide the things we need to live our lives, job opportunities or barrier-free buildings, for example. So you see, it's not a tragedy to those of us that have disabilities that we are living in wheelchairs or maybe not hearing what you are saying. The tragedy is that access accommodations could be provided, but sadly often really aren't. And you know, it's 2023 now. That means 33 years since ADA passed and lots of conversations about diversity, education and inclusion are no longer just nice to have, but really are an essential part of everybody's responsibility and everybody's organizations in order to thrive and grow. So today with our friends, uh, Stacy Hart and Jan Majewski from the Institute for Human Centered Design, they'll present uh, lots of stuff about ADA and 504 and give us some information about them and the Institute up in Boston. And we have great ASL interpreters, Shelly McAllister and Beth Anderson, and together we're all going to explore what it means to create access. So since all of us, the entire world and room um, have greatly benefited from Judy's work. May her passion and justice and dedication to disability inclusion really inspire us to ensure that her work and all of our work lives on. So I'm going to turn it over to Stacy and Jan. And again, thank you for coming and we'll be able to chat a little more at the end. Thank you. Hi everyone. So Judy and Janine just said it best, pretty much sums up this presentation uh, and we'll dive into uh, how people with disabilities should be able to participate in programs, services and activities. Jen and I are excited to be here. Uh, one of the best places to start in ensuring that people with disabilities can participate is to ensure compliance with Section 504 and the Americans with Disabilities Act. And we're going to talk about both of these laws and about obligations under each. Next slide. Jan and I are very lucky to work at the Institute for Human Centered Design, an educational design nonprofit dedicated to the role of design and in the social equity across spectrum of ability, age, culture, gender, and economic status. Design can really make or break an experience. Design not only has the power to make something more usable, but accessible design can be attractive as well. Next slide. The Institute has been home to the New England ADA Center since 1996. And the ADA Center is one of 10 regional centers across the country that provide information and training on the ADA as well as research. We are educators, we are not enforcers. And we're fortunate to have Jan. Jan works on uh, cultural and educational projects. So she's perfect for this training as well. Next slide. I've included one of our resources, the Title II Action Guide. It's included here because they, within this uh, tool, we provide sample notices and grievance procedures that you can use and adapt to meet your obligations under the Americans with Disabilities Act, as well as Section 504. Next slide. We have a full agenda, so please slow me down if I'm talking too fast. Um, First, we will start with a brief overview of Section 504 and the ADA, followed by disability demographic data in Rhode Island. Then we will talk about effective communication and auxiliary aids and services, followed by reasonable modifications of policies, practices, and procedures. 
then we will talk about administrative requirements. So basically, how do we implement ensuring that people with disabilities can participate? Following these five administrative requirements will help us do that. We will then touch on program and facility access, and then we will end with access specifically in cultural organizations. So let's get started. Our civil rights laws are so very critical, and here's why. The U.S. has a history of discrimination against people with disabilities and other people who are considered different in some way. And here's a few examples. States passed ugly laws, many of which were still in effect until the 1970s. People with disabilities could not go out in public, and if they did, they could be fined for doing so. Next, people with disabilities were often institutionalized and lived in squalid conditions where they were abused and neglected. Another example, people with disabilities were experimented on and they were forced, there was forced sterilization. Children with disabilities were housed in separate classrooms, so they were supposed to be receiving an education. Uh, truly, no education took place. They were put into separate spaces without interaction with their peers. And then a final example would be that there is this assumption that verbal communication is a sign of intelligence and people using other methods of communication are seen as less intelligent. And we just know that that's not the case. Next slide. The US has several civil rights laws that say that you cannot discriminate against someone solely on the basis of disability. The Rehabilitation Act Section 504 is very important because it was the first time that the federal government took an active role in ending the discrimination of people with disabilities by tying compliance to federal monies. Section 504 applies to federal government and federal agencies and any organiza organization receiving even $1 of federal monies. Next slide. So here's the premise of Section 504 and then later the ADA. No qualified individual with a disability in the United States shall be excluded from, denied the benefit of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity that either receives federal financial assistance or is conducted by an executive agency or the US Postal Service. Next slide. And so each federal agency had to adopt regulations to implement Section 504. So I wanted to include the National Endowment for the Arts regulations, Section 504 regulations. And similarly, state art, arts agencies are obligated to develop method, methods of administering federal funds so as to ensure that handicapped persons are not subjected to discrimination on the basis of handicap. Next slide. Still, many businesses and organizations don't have to follow Section 504 because they don't receive federal funds. So, Judy, as well as many other advocates, fought to pass the Americans with Disabilities Act. Similarly to Section 504, the ADA says you cannot discriminate against someone because of a disability. Uh, more proactively, people with disabilities have the right to participate in all programs, services, and activities. So, next slide. 
when we talk about the ADA, we talk about it in terms of these five titles. Title one. So if you have an employee with a disability who needs a reasonable accommodation, either to apply for a job or to do the job that they were hired to do, that's title one. Title two, state and local government. So your libraries, your senior centers, paying taxes, voting, all have to be accessible to people with disabilities and many other programs as well. Title three, places of public accommodation or private businesses, nonprofits open to the public. So oftentimes your private museums, uh, your grocery stores, your Starbucks, any of the errands that you run on the weekend, probably covered under Title Three, Title Four, telecommunications. So people who are deaf or hard of hearing, people with speech disabilities have the right to use the telephone service and they can do so by accessing the telephone service through the relay, uh, the relay. And then Title V, people with disabilities can file a complaint if they feel like they've been discriminated against on the basis of disability. It's also illegal for someone to be retaliated against for enacting or implementing this right to file a complaint. Next slide. So that's a very, very brief overview. And next we will talk a little bit about disability demographics in Rhode Island. Every group, regardless of age, gender, race, ethnicity, or economic status experiences disability. If we are lucky enough to live long enough, we're likely to acquire either a temporary or permanent disability. In order to be considered a person with a disability, under the ADA, a person must meet the definition of disability. And there are lots of definitions out there, but when we talk about uh, disability under the ADA, this is what we're talking about. Next slide. A person is a person with a disability if they have a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity. And those are big words, but really we're talking about impairment or disability in comparison to the average person. So we really want to, we don't want to spend a lot of time trying to decide who is and who is not a person with disability. We just want to make sure that they can participate. Uh, so the examples of disability, although an and not an exhaustive list would be learning disabilities, autism, depression, mental health, intellectual disabilities, and many more. Second, a person is a person with a disability if they have a record or history of an impairment. So a child who had a 504 plan or an IEP in school is a person who is covered under the definition or someone who has had cancer but is now in remission is a person with a disability. This comes up in employment because someone who is in remission still has doctor's appointments to verify periodically that they're still in remission. Also, someone in recovery and who is no longer using drugs illegally is covered under this second part. And then finally, a person is protected from discrimination if they are treated as if they have an impairment, whether or not they do. And because they are viewed as if they have a disability, they face negative consequences. So they are also protected from discrimination. A person only has to meet one of these three prongs of disability in order to file a complaint of discrimination. Next slide. IHCD conducted research in an attempt to identify how many people have disabilities as defined by 
the ADA in New England. We looked at the data from the US Census Bureau, the American Community Survey, and the 2008 Survey of Income and Program Participation. In Rhode Island, we found that almost 30% of citizens have a disability, 12% have a mental health disability, but only 1.5% of people with a disability use a wheelchair. The larger category of mobility disability is closer to 6%. These statistics surprised us, but do they surprise you? The stereotype of disability is often someone who uses a wheelchair. And that's just not the case. Most people with disabilities have non-apparent disabilities. Next slide. We all come to every situation with multiple ID identities, female, male, a person of color, LBGTQIA, and others. And people from marginalized groups are more likely to acquire a disability as well. Food for thought. If we aren't serving people with disabilities, then we really aren't serving anyone well. Next slide. So that's a very brief uh, a snapshot of our disability demographics. For more demographic data, certainly visit our website. We have all of the New England states and major cities within each New England state. Moving on to effective communication. Communication with people who have disabilities must be effective. Next slide. Communication should always start with good communication. However, sometimes good communication is not enough. And so you will need to provide auxiliary aids and services to ensure that communication is effective and that people with sensory disabilities can participate. Next slide. So we are gonna go through some examples of auxiliary aids and services. First, an in, a sign language interpreter can be a way of providing effective communication. An interpreter needs to be qualified, which means that they are able to communicate both receptively and expressively. And communication with an interpreter can take practice. Make sure that you're looking at the person who is deaf here in this picture, we would look at the uh, deaf man uh, and not the interpreter. The interpreter is a means or mode of communication. They are not the person that, that you're communicating with. Next slide. An interpreter can work one-on-one. -on -one. They can work in a group or they can be a part of a conference or a stage performance. The person can, the interpreter can work in person or virtually. Here today, we have our sign language interpreters via Zoom, so that's fantastic. An interpreter should work in front of a plain background and with good lighting. Next slide. Our next example of an auxiliary service would be video remote interpreting. This is good when an in-person sign language interpreter isn't available. You'll have to ensure that you have the technology to support the use of a remote interpreter. So computer, bandwidth, microphone. Um, of course, within the screen, you need to be able to see the head and arms and hands of the interpreter. So the FCC has made it clear that video remote services or video telecommunication, sorry, 
the video telecommunication relay services are a telephone service and are not intended to be used for an interpreting service where both parties are in the same room. The latter, so other types of interpreting are reserved for video remote interpreting. VRS cannot be used as a substitute for in-person interpreters and VRI uh, should not be used if the only reason you're using the telephone service is because the person is deaf. If you wouldn't ordinarily use the telephone, then you shouldn't be using VRS. You should be using video remote interpreting. Next slide. Here's what video remote interpreting would look like, or video telecommunication services would look like. A communication operator connects someone who is deaf and signs to someone who is hearing and does not sign and acts as a mediator or go between between the two. So sorry for the tongue twister. We have video telecommunication services, the telephone, and then we have video remote interpreting uh, for situations like we have here today. Next slide. Another example, assistive listening devices. This is a technology used by people that are hard of hearing to try, who try to make use of the hearing that they have. There are three main types, FM, infrared, and loop. Next slide. When you have assistive listening devices available, you need to provide signage, letting people know that it's available to them. Uh, when we're doing reviews of spaces, this sign is often the same. Next slide. If you have videos available to the public, including on your website, then they should be captioned. Captions are either open or closed. Open captions are always in view and cannot be turned on or off by the user, whereas closed captions can be turned on and off by the, by the viewer. Um, best practices would also be to include a sign language interpreter in those videos. Next slide. Moving on to people who are blind or low vision and how we can support them to participate in our programming. Next slide. A very small percentage of people who are blind or low vision actually learn Braille, maybe 10% give or take. And this makes sense given the leading cause of loss of sight. So the leading cause of blindness in American adults between 20 and 74 is diabetic retinopathy. And this is most com common among people who are black and Latinas, the Latinx community. Next slide. But Braille is an auxiliary aid that could allow someone to participate. Another aid or service would be to email or provide on a thumb drive the documents that are being used in a presentation. As long as those documents are provided in an accessible format. Next slide. That way, a person can use their own technology to access the information that you're providing. So they could use uh, voice to text, text to voice software. They might use refreshable breath. Next slide. Materials can be accessible, whether a Word document, text document, HTML or PDF, all of these can be built to be accessible. It's better to do that from the ground up because it's harder to go back and make documents accessible later. Next slide. Other auxiliary aids and services for short communication, uh, staff 
assistance could provide effective communication, reading a document to a person, helping someone fill out a form, what, what have you. Um, large print, uh, audio description. So if you're having a performance and you have someone who is blind, an um, auxiliary service would be to hire an audio captioner to describe what's happening on stage between the lines of um, the lines of the um, conversation. Next slide. So moving on to people who have speech disabilities, give your full and undid, undivided attention. This can be difficult because we're so used to multitasking. We really just need to be stop and be in the moment. And I guess that's probably true with most conversations. Don't interrupt or finish someone's sentences. You can ask someone to repeat what they're saying, but maybe only do it once or twice, twice because anxiety can increase a speech impediment. Paraphrase back what you think the person is trying to say so that they can confirm their understanding. Ask the person yes or no questions to reduce that communication load, try other forms of communication. So many people with disabilities, or some people with disabilities have speech impediments, but they still use their mouth voice parts, their voices. However, uh, some people with disabilities use technology to aid their communication. Anything thing from low tech to high tech, a, communi a simple communication board to an app on their telephone or iPad can help them communicate what they want to say. And all of it is valid, but they, they will, um, it will take longer to communicate. Next slide. Make sure that your websites are accessible and the Department of Justice has defined that as complying with WCAG, uh, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Um, and what does that look like? Next slide. It means, for example, and this is a non-exhaustive exhaustive list, be able to use the website without a mouse because people who are blind or low vision can't see the cursor. Uh, provide alt text or a description of the images on your websites and, and other uh, online media. Uh, if it's important enough to to use and it's important enough to describe. Design your website so that people can control the color of the font and background. Sometimes um, there are some vision disabilities that uh, respond better to red and yellow versus what we think of uh, dark or light, light on dark. Minimize blinking or flashing. The organization of the website is very important for people with learning or cognitive disabilities. And then as a best practice, use plain language, avoid jargon. Next slide. So sometimes people make requests that aren't possible. Uh, it may be an undue financial or administrative burden to provide a requested auxiliary aid or service. When that's the case, consider all the resources of the organization, not just for that program. Um, and then the conversation doesn't stop there. Uh, what aid or service can be provided that allows the person to participate. It's an ongoing conversation and the conversation is critical. Next question. So that's the end of effective communication. Now we'll move on to reasonable modifications of policies, practices, and procedures. 
when necessary to ensure that people with disabilities can participate, provide a reasonable modification of policies, practices, and procedures. Sometimes a person with a disability needs a support or a change in the program or how the program normally operates. Next slide. One of the most common examples is an organization can have a no pet policy, but then they must modify that policy to allow a person with a service animal to go anywhere that the public is allowed to go. So a service animal is not a pet. A service animal is a dog that is trained to do work or task for a person with a disability, whether that's physical, sensory, intellectually, um, et cetera. Too often we think of a service animal as being a seeing eye guide, but really dogs are very intelligent and can be trained to do lots of things. Uh, again, service animals are not pets. They perform some function or task that the individual with a disability cannot perform for themselves. Next slide. So it's, it's tricky though, right? So there are some tasks that are not considered worker tasks under this definition. So a service animal that is trained to protect a person with a disability is not considered a worker task under the ADA. The fact that most of dogs, pets provide a comfort and emotional support does not make that service animal a, uh, that does not make the dog a service animal. Emotional support animals are not service animals under the ADA. Next slide. Again, this is tricky stuff and it's easy for me to say, but harder to implement. An organization can ask two questions. Is the dog a service animal required because of a disability? And two, what worker task has the animal been trained to provide? That's it. An organization cannot request documentation or certification. A vest or any other identifier is not required, although some people do use, um, have their dog wear a vest or a harness that identifies them as, as such, but that's not required. Next slide. So where does that leave the agency, the organization? Well, care and supervision is the responsibility of the handler and owner. Um, a service animal may be excluded if the animal's behavior poses a direct threat to the health or safety of others. So if the animal is misbehaving, the organization, someone in the organization should talk to the person, give the person an opportunity to uh, get the animal under control. If the person cannot, for whatever reason, uh, they can ask that the service animal be removed and then uh, make sure that the person knows that they can come back without the service animal. Next slide. Ticketing for performances. Um, people with disabilities need to be able to purchase tickets in the same manner at the same time as everybody else. But then they need to have enough information to know where the accessible spaces are and information about the accessible spaces so that they can make informed decisions. So including the accessible seating in charts and maps would, is very helpful. Also hold all of the, hold the accessible seating in each uh, section until all of the other seating in that section are sold out at a minimum. Uh, you can 
you, going beyond that, you can hold the accessible seating until all seats are sold out. But really, you a minimum, you have to hold the accessible seating until the access until all other seats in that section or that price range are sold. Next slide. So I've been doing a lot of talking and I've been talking really fast, but I have a question for you. What do you do if a current, all the current wheelchair seating is limited to the first row and the last row of the theater? The theater sells accessible seating tickets online, which is good if everybody else can buy their tickets online. What, however, what are some good ways to solicit information in advance about seating needs? What are your thoughts? You can unmute yourself or enter uh, answers in the chat. And don't be shy. Hey, um, you could ask people what accessibility needs they have in terms of seating and how many people they're arriving with. Mm -hmm. And that's a good conversation to have um, if someone calls you for sure. Other thoughts? We'll get into this a little bit more momentarily, but certainly letting people know that there are accessible seats available and how to request them, you know, provide notification. And, you know, if you need reasonable accommodations or a sign language interpreter, please contact X. But we'll hold that thought for the moment. Next slide. How about, what if a person with diabetes comes to a Sunday museum class and has a backpack with a bottle of water and a few small snacks? The museum cafe is closed on Sundays. The museum prohibits food in the museum class areas. What do you do? What do you tell this person? Well, so this is a potential reasonable modification of your policy. You have a conversation with them about uh, where a space where they can have that stack. Maybe the person needs water versus juice. That's a conversation to have, making sure that the person has closed containers. Um, but this is definitely a possible reasonable modification of your policy. Um, remember, for policies and practices that you have, any of them, and we didn't get to too many examples, but someone could ask for a change in policy or practice. So, uh, and it's, it's, we cannot come up with a complete list, but just know that someone could ask. Are there some common reasonable modifications that you guys um, provide or have heard of? So far, we have service animals, we have the food policy. Um, Okay, well, next slide. 
Moving on to the administrative requirements. The ADA has five administrative requirements. First, designate a responsible employee. Notify the public about obligations under Section 504 and the ADA and what you're doing about them. Three, adopt a grievance procedure. Four, conduct a self-evaluation. And five, develop a transition plan. The administrative requirements are really a good thing, a positive thing, although sometimes I know people groan, but they're a guide to help an organization towards providing access. And we're going to take some time to discuss each one. Next slide. The first requirement, designating a responsible employee, they, this person is often called the 504 coordinator or the ADA coordinator. This person should be someone who knows about the requirements under Section 504 and make sure that the organization is complying with its obligations under Section 504. Unfortunately, the 504 coordinator is often one of many hats that a person wears and sometimes people are assigned this role with little or no training. Next slide. The 504 coordinator, the ADA coordinator has a lot to do and a lot of responsibility. First, ensure that people with disabilities in the community and employees with disabilities have an opportunity to participate in program services and activities in a full and an integrated and meaningful way for inclusion. The coordinator helps proactively prevent issues from arising, but if something does come up, they help to resolve the issue. Three, they serve as the primary point of contact for all things 504, for their colleagues, for members of the community, for their boards. They coordinate compliance efforts to help sure that the, help the organization be inclusive of people with disabilities. Next slide. Number five, they are re responsible for notifying the public about the organization's 504 efforts. They help arrange sign language interpreters and provide reasonable accommodations so that people can access and participate in programs and services. They are responsible for reviewing grievances that are filed. Staff are caring and they do so much for, to help assist people. Even still, someone still has the right to file a complaint and expect that their complaint is taken seriously. Next slide. If the organization hasn't done so already, they need to conduct a self-evaluation of all program services and activities, and then develop a transition plan to address the issues that were uncovered. They are the point person for training staff, uh, new staff and on an ongoing basis. They consult with staff, the board, the public to ensure that people can participate. Essentially, they are the 504 busybody. They should be involved in all projects that could affect accessibility. And from there, all other administrative requirements flow. So the second one. The second requirement is notification. Be transparent about your compliance efforts and celebrate your successes. And you do this by notifying the public. People need to know, again, how to request a reasonable modification or sign language interpreters. And while everybody works hard to do their best, people need to know how to file a complaint. Also, uh, as part of your 504 requirements, include a statement 
the like this, the recipient recipient does not discriminate in the admission or access to or employment in programs or activities. Next slide. So where do you provide notice? Well, you provide notice in any uh, publication that you would normally provide information. So on your website, people go uh, to your website to provide information about your organization. Also provide a non-discrimination sta statement. And if people need accommodations, please contact Todd. Um, you also would include it in any program brochure or application on social media. And so any, any board reports or annual reports include a statement of access there as well. Next slide. The third requirement, adopt a grievance procedure. Like the notice, you will find sample documents for grievance procedures in our Title II Action Guide. Again, it's always better to make a good faith effort to resolve issues internally through a grievance procedure, which has timeframes for adherence as well as an appeals process. Um, if you ignore someone, then they have the right to file a complaint. Next slide. Fourth requirement, self-evaluation. Everything needs to be evaluated, not just the physical space or facility, but the programs and services that take place in that space. And this is overlaid with any formal policies and procedures and, and informal practices. Next slide. Look at policies and whether or not they could screen out people with disabilities. So your frontline staff might know that you have a no pets policy. And so then they might stop someone at the front door if they bring a service animal. And so they need to know that a service animal is allowed. Or someone might not be allowed to come in if they don't have a support person with them. And that's not okay either. So to ensure that people with disabilities can participate, then we want to look at our reasonable modifications or auxiliary aids and services process. And also look at our training so that we make sure that staff know what our obligations are under Section 504. Next slide. Do people know how to make a request for auxiliary aids and services, like assistive listening devices or sign language interpreters? This is where the notification provide clear communication to the public. And then once the request is made, does staff know how to start the process for getting this a service like a sign language interpreter? This will be important to investigate as part of the self-evaluation process. Next slide. Here are some more questions that will guide the evaluation. Have service uh, interpreters been, sorry, have interpreting services been identified so that when a request comes in, um, it's a much quicker process from the request to hiring someone. Is the equipment such as the assistive listening systems in working order? Is there a, a process for maintenance? Uh, checking the batteries, checking the system every six months or three months, uh, depending on what you determine is necessary. Because too often uh, someone comes and they request an assistive listening device and staff have to hunt for it. And then it's not working because the batteries are dead. So having a process to make sure that the equipment works. Next slide. 
Similarly, you want to ask these questions about reasonable modifications, reasonable accommodations. Has there is there a process for requesting a reasonable modification? Do staff know what to do once a request comes in? Next slide. We talked a little bit about this earlier. Websites need to comply with web accessibility. Uh, WCAG Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. But what does that mean? I certainly uh, would have a difficult time ensuring full compliance of my website. So during the self-evaluation, use experts to determine whether or not your website is accessible. Use user experts to review the website to ensure accessibility. Um, and then that makes sure that the website is more, more usable for everybody. Next slide. Here's an incomplete list of documents that you'll need to review during the self-evaluation. Your applications, any waivers, any employee manuals, and more. Next slide. Staff buy-in is critical and frontline staff interact directly with the public. So it's important to talk to them. We want to make sure that they understand the organization's 504 obligation. How does the organization, and so here's some questions that you might ask. How does the organization interact with the public? What policies and procedures might affect the visitor's experience? Are there barriers that the person is aware of? Uh, during COVID, there were, we organizations tried to set up two different routes, an entrance and an exit. Well, are both of those routes accessible for people with disabilities? Next slide. Evaluations include everything from going through documents, reviewing policies or procedures, to measuring door widths and reviewing physical space for barriers. Next slide. Many people with disabilities are unable to take advantage of an organization's programs, services, or activities because of things like steps at an entrance, small toilet rooms, lack of accessible play areas, and other inaccessible features. No qualified individual because of a disability shall because of a facility, because the facility is inaccessible, be excluded from participation, be denied benefits of program services and activities, or be subjected to discrimination. So access and participation is tied to the program, not to the actual physical space. So that means that there are no, there's no such thing as grandfathering. We often hear, but my building is so old. It was built before the ADA was went into effect and maybe even before section 504. The idea is not full access. It's about making sure that the person can participate. Next slide. So, whoops, next slide. So certainly physical access and alterations could be a thing that needs to be undertaken, but other things could be moving a program to an accessible space. It could also mean the use of staff as to ensure access. Um, so it's, it's not necessary that an organization needs to go undergo millions of dollars in renovations. We just need enough access so that a person with a disability can participate. Next slide. So in the transition plan, you'll need to describe the problem, which you just found out in this self-evaluation. 
the solution. So how are you going to fix the issue? When it's going to be fixed and who's responsible for making the changes? We would also recommend including an, a line item for estimated cost. Um, next slide. And then you need to keep track of who you talked to and the organizations that you consulted, the descriptions of areas that were reviewed, and any problems that you found out about for three years. Use the transition plan as a tool to track an organization's progress on an ongoing basis. Next slide. Of course, some of the organizations participating in this uh, might be private businesses or nonprofits that don't receive any federal or state monies. So then your obligation is slightly different. It's readily achievable berry removal. This is the low hanging fruit of access. You must do the things to improve access that are easy to do and don't cost a lot of money. And that's dependent on your, your budget. What's affordable for one organization may not be affordable for another. Next slide. I'll turn it over to Jan. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to talk with you. As Stacy said earlier, I work on cultural inclusive design in educational and cultural projects. So IHCD works with museums and cultural organizations across the country, trying to ensure that we are becoming more inclusive or museums and cultural organizations are becoming more inclusive to people with disabilities. Um, what I'd like to talk about for the next couple of minutes is what does Section 504 in the ADA look like in cultural organizations? So basically applying all that Stacy has told you in cultural organizations. Next slide, please. The American Alliance of Museums made a, put out a DEAI, Diversity, Equity, Accessibility and Inclusion Statement that states that museums are a vital part of how we tell the stories of who we are, who we've been, and how we will live together. We cannot claim to be truly essential to society if we are not accessible to all. So the ADA, Section 504, and DEAI, or however organizations order those letters, two are federal laws, one is a moral imperative, ensure people with that people with disabilities are part of society's story. Next please. Integrated setting is a major goal of the ADA. When I started in museums many, many years ago, all of the programs and not necessarily equal. A public accommodation must offer its programs, its goods and services, advantages and accommodations in the most integrated setting possible. They must think in terms of layers and choices for how accessibility is provided. So that, for example, someone who is blind and comes to a museum and takes a single touch tour has an option for when they come back. What do they do? They can't take the same touch tour or a touch tour is not something that they're particularly interested in how else can they get information? What other accessibility can be offered? Next, please. Separate programming can meet the visitor where he is, but it can also prove to be a, a bridge to where he could be. On the left, you see a photograph of a young boy looking up at a um, aquarium tank and he has on noise canceling headphones. This is a program at the Smithsonian called Morning at the Museum, where a museum or an organization can allow people in who have brain-based disabilities that may affect their ability to filter stimuli to come into the museum at a time when there aren't a lot of people 
and maybe the lights may be a little bit dimmer or they may have shut off some of the sound. That's a wonderful program, but it's also a way to bring people back into the museum, helping them feel comfortable coming in and understanding where they can go that may be quieter, even when there are a lot of people in the space. The second pic photograph is of a man who is quoted as saying, I realize that when you have Alzheimer's, you don't know if your memory is correct. The program, that's the See Me program, excuse me, at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, gave me the confidence to know that I'd been able to retain my appreciation of art. So he would feel comfortable coming back to the museum to enjoy the art, even though it's not within a separate segregated program. Next, please. The ADA's goals go well beyond separate, separate programs. And this is the same for Section 504. It is about making sure that people have equal opportunity to programs regardless of their abilities, whether they need accommodations or providing the accommodations so that they can enjoy the programs. It is not only entrances, ramps, and toilets, which many organizations still think if they have those three things under control, then the rest of their organization is accessible. On the right, you see a photograph of two women, one who is taking a tour with someone from the museum. This is the International Spy Museum. And she is, the sculpture is tactile. And she is standing in front of the sculpture with her service animal. Next, please. There are many common physical access issues in cultural organizations. You can see at the right a photograph of the entrance to Arena Stage. That's a Washington, D.C. theater organization. And they can range anywhere from the route from parking and public transit to the entrances, the entrances, the accessible route, information and welcome and ticketing desks, stanchion barricades, which become oftentimes problematic for two reasons, one for width and turning, and two, they are frequently the stanchions that have a single band at the, the top so that they provide no cane detection and someone who is blind or has low vision using a white cane or even sometimes with a dog can walk right into the stanchion. And I've seen people actually accidentally pull the stanchions all the way down because they've hit it with their body shops and cafes, exhibit layout, furniture layout, theater entrances, restrooms, signage, classrooms, labs, and studios, seating, which is highly recommended, particularly with back and arm support, acoustics, there are not standards for that, but we know how important acoustics are so that people who are deaf or hard of hearing are not constantly bombarded with background noise. A lot of older adults who have what they call the cocktail effect and can't sort the primary conversation that they're listening to from all the background noise. It's very important and people have to figure it out as well as lighting, which again does not have standards, but we need to figure out so that people can move easily through spaces and feel safe in their navigation. Next slide. Areas of primary function is the formal term of art for the ADA, and it means the major activity for which the facility is intended. So if an organization does an alteration to an area of primary function, you want to make sure that people can get to it, that there are restrooms nearby, that there are amenities like water fountains nearby, so that they it's not a matter of just getting to the function and not having anything else, or sometimes it's not even getting to the function. So areas of primary function can include exhibitions, theaters, lobbies, atriums where programs are held, classrooms, studios, and displays in visitor centers. You can see in this rendering, it's a lobby area of a theater space. There is a ramp that comes up the two stairs that are for entry into the space. Next, please. As Stacy said, a lot of people 
a lot of organizations who are in historic buildings or are historic landscapes feel that they don't have to do anything for accessibility. They feel that they are quote unquote grandfathered. And under the ADA and under Section 504, there is no grandfathering. So access must be provided to the programs, if not directly by being able to walk into the building or roll into the building, then alternative programs may be a solution, videos, photographs, virtual reality. But it's really important to realize that alternative programs should not be the first choice, they should be the last resort. The idea, going back to that idea of integrated access, is that you find ways to make your organization as accessible as possible to everyone so that they can come in with their families and friends, regardless of whether families and friends have disabilities as well. Historic houses, you could just go back to theaters, parks, streets with historic cultural landscapes all need to consider these. And the images here are from Mount Vernon Estates, George Washington's Mount Vernon, where they, with a, a DOJ settlement agreement, made many changes to make the um, all of its facilities more accessible, including its gravel paths, but where it could not get people into the second and third floor of the mansion they provided virtual programming. Next, please. Common modifications and policies or procedures that are required. These are, we talked about earlier, and there's a wonderful example in the chat of the person who said that um, they needed to bring ICE into an, an organization for um, chronic pain and were told they had to buy it. That would be a perfect, reasonable modification to be able to bring in your own ice as long as it's contained and you're not you know, dripping as you go through the space. But some of the modifications are thinking about how high you install images, for example, in museums so that people who use wheelchairs or are short stature don't have the problem in this comic strip to the right where the little boy says, we've been in this part already. Mommy, I remember this event because that's, he's short enough that all he can see of the museum images, which are well above his head, is the, is the vent, the air vent below. So thinking about exhibition design, mechanical interactive control, ticketing kiosk design, exhibition content, including the experiences of people with disabilities into the context so that people can see reflections of themselves, their own stories when they are in the theater or in the museum or other organizations. Use of other power driven mobility devices. Only the government could come up with OPDMDs, but this is talking about what are your policies if someone needs to bring in a Segway or if they are using a scooter that they are kneeling on because they have a leg cast on eating and drinking within the exhibits, as Stacy talked about, and carrying a backpack within an exhibition, and of course, service animals. Next, please. Common cultural organization issues with auxiliary aids and services. You can see the image on the right is a man who is speaking with, uh, with captioning, and captioning on online programs that we started in cultural organizations to offer so much more frequently during COVID and are now continuing. So thinking about online programs and making sure that captioning, interpreting, assistive listening, audio description, audio wayfinding, et cetera, are all included so that people can use online programs as well as on-site programs equally accessible label and graphics design, accessible linear media and digital interactive, museum classroom and studio programs, and also video conferencing as we have a perfect example of today. Next, please. There is some confusion in cultural organizations as to whether or not they are required as the ADA Title III requires 
movie theater captioning and audio description. The ADA regulation purposely says that um, the, those facilities that are not used primarily for the purpose of showing new movies for a fee, such as museums, hotels, resorts, cruise ships, are not obligated under this part of the regulation. However, the regulation always requires that effective communication must be provided. So museums and cultural organizations that provide movies must think about this as well. And on the right, there's a photograph. It is a drawing, a rendering of basically how one way a movie can show from its projection booth to, through to the basically Google glasses or other devices can show captions without actually having them on the screen for everyone to review, to watch. Next, please. Stacy talked about websites, which are very, very important. And not only do they need to be compliant with, with WCAG, they also are a key source of information for the organization's accessibility. So the physical, the program, the auxiliary aids and services, the scheduling services, as well as reservations, all can be up on the website so people can read them ahead of time and understand what they, one, can ask for if they have to ask for something in advance, or two, what they can expect to get in the cultural organization and where they have to find it. It can address online ticketing, online programming, and supplemental services. On the right is a screenshot of the Kennedy Center's page for accessibility for patrons and visitors with disabilities, and they list out all of their services. Next, please. Other issues are um, that personal service devices and services, many times museums in particular will offer wheelchairs as um, a courtesy. That is a courtesy. However, audio description services or assistive listening devices are required. So even though you, you don't have to provide participants with personal devices, there are many devices that must be provided in the name of providing effective communication. There are also services that you can decide whether you will provide, such as pushing an elderly person who may not normally use a wheelchair, but wants to borrow one through a large facility, but that should be decided by policy and the decision should be sound and the staff trained. On the right is an image of a collection of wheelchairs that are in a museum um, that you know, stored for people to use. Next, please. This is a key issue that is often forgotten. If you put accessible features into place, make sure that they are maintained. So in this image, you see a small shop in a museum. The lowered counters that were for people who use wheelchairs or are short stature have been filled up with other equipment. And so they cannot serve their purpose. They were not maintained. They, this can happen in exhibition design. This, again, those stanchions we talked about, they can be moved and become barriers. If floors are polished to a high sheen, people may have trouble reading them if they have vision loss or brain-based disabilities. Dimmed lighting, as Stacy said, auxiliary aids and services have to be maintained and charged. Staff have to know where things are and have to know where they can get them. Websites change, and as they change, they're not necessarily maintained as compliant. And finally, as we said, sales counters that have unusu unusable accessible counters. Next. And finally, Stacy mentioned the term user experts. IHCD works a lot with people with disabilities in asking for people's input on what works and what doesn't. In cultural organizations, 
We will have people come in and test prototypes. We will have people judge, work with in um, digital interactives to see if they are effective in allowing people to participate fully. And sometimes we will have people just go through an entire um, visitor process and watch them and observe and get feedback on what works or what doesn't. So getting feedback from people with disabilities or people who are secondary experts who work with or live with people with disabilities is essential in our way of thinking. Next and final. Stacey, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Okay. Um, we have a few minutes for questions. Did we have any questions in the chat? Yeah, so there were a couple that were um, very specific to points that you made during um, your presentation. Um, one was, if you could explain the difference between disability and significant disability that you talked about in the demographics. Um, so a significant disability, and I, I would have to look up the exact de definition of, of the difference between significance and, and the disability. I don't have it on me, but it has something to do with how the American Community Survey and these other surveys that we use define disability. Um, one of the definitions of disability included being regarded as someone with a disability. Can you clarify what this means? Is it re referring to someone seeing physical impl implications? Regarded is, you know, we, we view someone for whatever reason, maybe they have uh, scars from burns. And so because of some perception of that person, we view them as someone with a disability and, and then we treat them differently because of that. Um. Someone asked about the three, what are the three main types of assisted list, listening devices? To repeat them, yeah. um, the FM system, infrared, and loop. Um, these are, people are getting into the nitty gritty here. So most of the questions are, are very um, nitty gritty on the presentation, but um, how do you go about formatting documents? Um, you talked about that you can format Word documents and PDFs and things like that to be accessible. How do you do that? Oh, wow. Yeah, we we don't have time to go uh, how to create an accessible document. Uh, for, but for example, for this presentation with our PowerPoint, we there's an option built into PowerPoint an accessibility checker. And so we ran that checker and then we edited our PowerPoint to ensure that it was accessible. And I know there is a way to do that with each of those types of documents. Great. Um, and those, are, and the captions didn't pick up the response on the three listening devices. Can someone please add it to the chat? So, um, one of you who are expert in that could do that. That would be great. Um, and Todd, I think we're at time. So I think I'm gonna turn it back to you. Yes, thank you, Nancy. And thank you everyone today. So just so you all know, we'll be following up with an email after this that'll have a recording in a couple of days, as well as a PowerPoint presentation. We'll also send a link to a resource page that RISCA has made that is somewhat specific to arts and cultural organizations, but many of the things on there are relevant to everyone. There's also uh, access to um, programs we did last year around access and accessibility, specifically focused on small, mid-sized, and volunteer-led nonprofit organizations. Um, lastly, if you have any additional questions, you can feel free to email me and we'll see if we can get you that information. I know many of you have asked about funding. We'll include in the follow-up email information about the Sherlock Center in Rhode Island and, and how they have grants available for ADA access, as well as the Champlin Foundation who funds uh, changes to uh, physical structures of buildings, et cetera.
Thank you so much um, to Janet. Just, Sorry, go ahead. One other thing is that um, there is a local Rhode Island nonprofit called RAMP, um, Real Access Motivates Progress, I think is the acronym. Um, and they will do wheel throughs of your um, facility to be able to kind of identify accessibility issues in your um, facility. So if you're interested in that, we'll also include a link um, so that you can connect with them. Also, the Rhode Island Governor's Commission on Disability can help with some of that uh, physical access review. Uh, I know they definitely do it for Title II, and then they'll sometimes work with Title III as well. Great. Thank you, you two. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, we'll send links to all that information in the follow-up. Uh, Janine, I don't know if you had anything to add, otherwise I can close this out. Yeah, I just have a, a, a quick wrap-up thing because I truly believe that those of us in the arts are really great problem solvers. So I, I think that this is something that is certainly uh, within our realm of accomplishing. And um, with all things, you know, change is inevitable. And I think mostly we do know how to be adaptable. So if we embrace this, if we lean on others, some of the places that they mentioned uh, to bring in alternative solutions, I think that would be awesome. And like all arts processes, um, access, yeah, things may not go according to plan immediately. <laughs> you know, sometimes we do something as a start and then have to look at it and go back and, and tweak it, but that's part of the process. And so I think creating successful access practices takes, you know, time and commitment. And I think, and I thank, you know, Jan and Stacy for all this great information today. I think this will enable us to um, make a first step towards improving our access, and especially with RISCA, who on their grant proposals now actually has questions about access as well as an access line in their budget for you to help implement some of these things is a great starting point for us to move forward and really uh, improve our entire community here in Rhode Island. So thank you all very much. I really appreciate your attendance. Thank you, Jean. Thank you for your all your work and advocacy over the many years in this regard. We really appreciate it. And the state has benefited from it on the whole. Um, I'll say too, I am the ADA coordinator at uh, RISCA, as well as the acting deputy director for arts and culture community folks. I can be your point person for information. Again, thank you, Jan and Stacy. You are awesome. Uh, Shelly and Beth, thank you as oh, well. Totally. Um, and Nancy, always a pleasure co-hosting these things with you. Have a wonderful rest of your morning, everyone, and we will talk again soon.